Um, so Grant said we're ending the David series today, and it's interesting. You know, we've been, we've been uh, walking through the life of David. For those of you that haven't been here, uh, actually 21 weeks we've been walking. Today's the 21st week that we have walked through the life of this remarkable individual. And today it comes to an end. Today this, uh, this series, we're coming to this close of it. And uh, you know that old saying, um, all good things must come to an end? I hate that saying. Like, I don't care if I'm eating ice cream or... Uh, like on vacation, I hate that saying because all good things do have to come to an end. And, uh, and this series is no exception. I've really enjoyed kind of walking through this life of David and seeing some of the things that we've seen. And, and certainly now we're going to come to this place where it ends. But what's fascinating about this is um, this good thing comes to an end in a really weird sort of way. And, and I want to explain to you that, that the, the, the way David's story, the way his life comes to culmination in this book that we've been looking at and walking through his life, um, it, it, it's, like, it's like one of those times it's like you've watched a movie and, and the, the movie's coming to an end, you know, you know because your bladder's telling you it should be coming to an end, you know, but you don't want to miss anything. But then all of a sudden the screen goes dark and you're assuming you're about to go to the next final scene. And instead of the next final scene, the credits roll up the screen. You ever been in that situation where you're like, no, 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 time out. Like, this movie can't end this way. Has anybody ever felt that way about a movie? Like, you're like, are you kidding me? Like, you guys get paid to write this stuff? Like, I hate unresolved, weird endings. I always just want to, like, just call somebody and say, Can, did you run out of money? Like, did you guys run out of creativity? Like, you got to this point, and you're like, and it's over. The end. And they just walk away from it. Like, what is that? That's how I feel about the way David's life ends. Uh, for, the, for the last... A um, couple of weeks, you know, I've known we're coming in for a landing on this. And I've been reading these verses that we're going to look at today. And I'm like, really, God? Like, you're the author of creation, right? You could probably write something really awesome. And this is what we get. This is how the story ends. It's really interesting. But there's, in the middle of this, something fascinating about the way it does end. I'm going to do something really unusual today. I'm going to just, we're going to read through some of the final verses that, are, that record David's life. Maybe just to prove to you how boring it potentially could be. And then we're going to unpack this. And I think what you're going to see is this may be a little bit surprising. So if you have your Bible, I want you to open to, to 2 Samuel chapter 24. Um, the books of 1 and 2 Samuel are two of the books that primarily record the life of David. And uh, in fact, they aren't really two books. So they were writ originally written as one big book. For those of you that maybe wonder sometimes, we just divide them up for simplicity's sake. Um, but 2 Samuel chapter 24, David's life. In this incident, there's, there's, a, there's a circumstance that's taken place. David has done something that seems really unusual. And you're going to, like, as we walk through this, you're going to go, really? Like, this is what this story is about? Um, the final story of David is essentially summed up by this moment of David making a decision to number the army of Israel, to basically count, and I'll explain this in a little bit, but to count the soldiers in Israel. And, and in 2 Samuel 24, we're going to pick up in verse 10 of where that decision begins to unfold in David's heart and then in the life of Israel. And I think you'll see what I'm talking about when, when you see how this thing ends. So verse 30 of 2 Samuel 24, I'm sorry, verse 10 says this. Verse 30, we'd be over and done, which some of you are like, cool, we're quick today. It says, but David's heart struck him after he had numbered the people. And David said to the Lord, I've sinned greatly in what I've done. But now, O Lord, please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done foolishly. And when David arose in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, go and say to David, thus says the Lord, three things I offer you. Choose one of them that I may do it to you. Now, this is not like a genie, rub the bottle, you're going to get your favorite wish. Listen to what he says, verse 13. So Gad came to David and told him and said to him, shall three years of famine come to you in your land? Or will you flee three months before your foes while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days pestilence in your land? Now consider and decide what answer I shall return to him who sent me. There's your choices, right? You get, you get one of three things. You can have three years of famine. You can have three months of military defeat. Or you can have three days of pestilence in the land or plague. Then David said to God, I'm in great distress. Let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is great. But let me not fall into the hand of man. And so the Lord sent pestilence on Israel from the morning until the appointed time, and there died of the people, listen to this, 70,000 men. 
And when the angel stretched out his hand toward Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from the calamity and said to the angel who was working destruction among the people, it's enough. Now stay your hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite. Then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people and said, Behold, I've sinned and I've done wickedly, but these sheep, what have they done? Please let your hand be against me and against my father's house. And Gad came to David that day and said to him, Go up and raise an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. And so David went up at Gad's word as the Lord commanded And then there's this negotiation that takes place in order to get the sacrifice. And then in verse 25, it says this, And David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord responded to the plea for the land, and the plague was averted from Israel. The end. Right? I look at this, I think, "Are are you kidding me? Like, all the ups and all the downs, battles, giants, swords, deception, lying, confrontation. Like this has been like a daytime soap opera and then it ends like I wrote all my papers in high school. Like just get me out of this. Like I just want to be done and turn it in, right? Like this is crazy. Like this is it. But when you look at this, there's so much embedded in this, and it makes so much sense. And as, as strange as this may be, and I'll just tell you that for, for me, for weeks reading this, I'm going, why does it end this way? Why does it end this way? But as you begin to look at this, you see beneath the layers of this story something that makes all of this make sense. This is a culmination story that exemplifies who David is. There's something that, that happens here that summarizes. It's a summation of all that David has been through the course of this life that he's been living. Now, there is a problem that's presented in this story, and I think it's a good one for us to address. There's a problem embedded in this that that gets raised, and it's one that that comes up a lot in the Old Testament. It's come up in this series, and it's this issue of of, of why God judges. That kind of screams out of this passage as you read it. You think, wait a second, wait, what's going on here? And, and, And ultimately, why is God sending this plague? I mean, why, when God gives David three choices, are all of them this this sort of sort of judgment? In our culture, in the Western culture today, in the Western mind, we wrestle, we struggle with these sorts of things. We wrestle with a God who extends his judgment on humanity, a God who would behave this sort of way. This, this raises questions in our minds. And for me, for you, you have times when you just wrestle, like, why, why does the Old Testament have these sorts of stories of God doing these things? And I, I think a common question I hear people bring up, something people say to me is, um, how can I believe in a God who, who judges people? And and behaves this sort of way. And, it, and it's, it's, a really good, it's a really good question to ask. But I think if we're going to ask that question, we have to ask other questions. And one of the other questions that this really asks us to respond to is, why does God's judgment come down? Like, where does God's judgment come? Like, we maybe have a problem with it, and you can't read the Old Testament, and you can't read even the life of David and, and not see it, but the question is, when God judges, why does God judge? What's the reasoning behind it? The answer is fascinating. As you look at the Old Testament, you'll see a consistent pattern, you'll see a theme, and you'll see that the predominant reason that God judges humanity, that he brings a plague, that he punishes people, is human violence against other humans. That's when God judges. When, when you think about Noah, when, when, when Noah's building the ark and God's going to flood the earth, the reason that God gives Noah for doing this is that the earth is filled with what? Violence. The earth is filled with violence. Human beings are violent towards one another. When Jonah goes to Nineveh and rebukes Nineveh and proclaims that they need to turn and repent. The reason that Jonah goes to Nineveh is because of their violence. He goes to them and says, repent of your violence. It's, it's violence that's causing them to get God's judgment. Sodom and Gomorrah, it was their abuse of the poor that, that initiated God's initial judgment on them. It was their injustice. It was their abuse of other people. If you read prophets like Amos and Isaiah and, and you move on and even into this story, what you see is that God consistently over and over again 
again, punishes people, judges people, brings judgment upon those who are abusing other human beings. God judges human violence. That's the main thing that God judges. Western mind says, well, I, I can't believe in a God that judges because if a God judges, then that's going to result in human violence. The Bible actually says just the opposite of that, that God's judgment is actually an antidote to human violence. It's an antidote to this poison that stirs up inside of humanity. Think about it this way. When, when, you're, when you experience violence, when somebody does something against you, whether it's physical or emotional, if somebody steals something from you, if someone commits a crime against you, when these sorts of things happen, there's this response. You get sucked into this cycle of retaliation where I can't help but do something. And, and anytime you've ever experienced this, like if you've ever, I remember years ago, somebody stole my bike out of my garage. And you know, some of you know how much I love my bike. My immediate response is, I'm going to kill him, right? <laughs> Whoever it is, you took my bike, right? Like, that's an immediate response. We get into this cycle of retaliation. And it's virtually impossible to not get sucked into this. If you've, if you've ever been a part of this, you know what I'm talking about. On an individual level, when things happen to us, there is something inside of us that says, I'm going to hurt you back. I'm going to hurt you for what you've done. I'm going to punish you. When it happens as adults, that, that, that certainly is the case. We, we know statistically and sociologically that children who, who are abused as children have a, have a high rate of repeating that and being abusers themselves, right? Because there's this cycle that says something's been done to me. I'm going to continue to do that. Sociologically and on a larger cultural level, we do that as cultures. If you look at the ethnic cleansing that went on uh, in like Croatia in the 90s and in the Baltics, you, you, you realize that a lot of that violence, a lot of the, the, the things that went on, the warring that took place was because somebody had done something to somebody in a generation previous. And so the excuse was given, well, they did that to us then. And so now we're doing this here in this place. That's what we do. We respond to violence with violence. There's this, this clashing that takes place. There's this retaliation that takes place. And things like ethnic cleansing start to happen when we say they did it to me first. That's the human cycle that we fall into. When you're a victim of violence, you respond with violence. And the Bible says it's the judgment of God that actually can prevent this, that can stop this. There's a Croatian theologian, his name is Miroslav Volf, and, uh, and he was a part of the Balkan conflicts, and now he's a professor at, at Princeton, and he makes this astounding statement. Listen to this quote by Miroslav Volf. He says, Violence thrives today secretly nourished by the belief that God refuses to judge or take the sword. Why does violence continue in humanity? Because we refuse to believe that God judges or takes the sword. The only antidote to violence in the world is the idea or the belief that God will judge violence in the world. That's the only thing that stops that. And we, we might ask the question, well, how, how could that be? I mean, I, if God's judging, doesn't that promote violence? Is that the case? Again, the average Western thinker, if you believe those sorts of things, that's, that's the natural outcome for us. But the only way, the only way that the Western mind that says a God of judgment breeds a God of violence, the only way that works is if you live a very comfortable life and you never have someone commit violence against you. It's the moment somebody does something against you, the moment, the moment that somebody acts out towards you, everything you learned in a freshman philosophy class goes out the window and you just want to get even. And as soon as you experience injustice, you know what justice looks like and you're prepared to bring justice about the only way, the only way that we can respond to violence non-violently is knowing that there is a God who will judge. That's the only way we can do it. That's the only way emotionally we can handle those things is if we understand that God will judge those who act violently against other humans. That's what gives us the freedom to relinquish this. It's also what keeps us from acting out because suddenly there's this reality. Am I going to engage in what God judges? 
God's hope for humanity is a new humanity, a flourishing humanity, a nonviolent humanity. And he says, I will do everything to keep you from living that sort of way. So the only belief that's powerful enough to stop th this poison that's in our veins is a belief that God will set things right. He will set things right. And if you believe something else, then you probably live a very comfortable life. So the Bible presents the judgment of God as this antidote towards human violence. And so then the question is, well, then why is God judging Israel in this? Right? Like, if that's the issue, then why is God judging Israel? This doesn't, this doesn't fully resolve the problem. I mean, you look at this and you say, is this really that big of a deal? Like, David is numbering the armies of Israel. Why is this a big enough deal that God would, in fact, actually in numbers, God told Moses to number the people of Israel, to number the army, and now it's a crime. God's getting upset. He's punishing. He's bringing his judgment. And in verse 10, you even see that David is conscious of this. He's, he's stricken with this. There's, there's this moment where David actually says, I, I'm convicted by what I've done. There's this moment where you realize, like, there's something wrong in this. But why? At the beginning of the chapter, this is what it says in verse 2. It says, So the king said to Joab, the commander of the army who was with him, Go through all the tribes of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, and number the people that I may know the number of the people. But Joab said to the king, this is Joab pushing back on him, and listen to what he says, May the Lord your God add to the people a hundred times as many as they are, while the eyes of my Lord the king still see it. But why does my Lord the king delight in this thing? Like, why is your heart delighting in this? Why is your heart dependent on knowing how many people are in your army? There's this question that's being asked. But the king's word prevailed against Joab and the commanders of the army. So Joab and the commanders went out from the presence of the king to number the people of Israel. And I know you read this and you say, well, then what's the big deal? I mean, on the surface, this doesn't really look like that big of a deal. It certainly doesn't look like something where God should judge an entire nation. What's so bad about counting the fighting men? There are two reasons that this is wrong. And the first one, all of you that are parents are going to love it, Okay. You might want to write this down. But the first reason it's wrong is because God said so. <laughs> right? And those of you that are parents, you understand. There's a moment when you're just done explaining and you just say, because I said so. And it feels so good to say it. And some of us, we determined that we would never say that as parents. And then the first day you say it, it just feels good. You're like, ah, oh, now I know why they said that to me. One of the reasons it's wrong is because God says it's wrong. There, and there are other reasons, and we're going to look at this. But, but the first and foremost, and this is the one I think our mind struggles with the most, the, the main reason this is wrong is because God said so. God said this was wrong. And in the modern mind, we read this passage, and our natural conclusion is to say, God, you're overreacting. Like, you're out of control. You're upset. I mean, who does this hurt? It doesn't make any sense. Those are the kind of questions that we ask, like, what's the big deal with this? We ask those kinds of questions, like, why would you do this? But I want you to realize that something is wrong here. That's the point of this. Something is wrong simply because God said it is. Even if we can't see why, even if it doesn't make sense, even if you can't even understand the downside of it, something is wrong, and God is saying that. Um, my, my kids, um, not all of them, and I have to be very vague because when I'm specific about my children on a Sunday, they um, demand money from me. And so um, some of my children that live in my house who will remain nameless, um, they, they have a tendency to, to want me to explain things to them, right? So, I, so there's, no, there's no place for me to say, because I said so. There's this tendency um, sometimes for them to demand an explanation for whatever it is I've said. They ask something, and I, and I tell them, and then they say, well, why, right? And they start this when they're really little, right? I mean, and it's really cute when they're little. Like, you're just this inquisitive, you know, wonderful, like, made in the image of God child. And then when they get into their, like, preteen and teen years, you're like, who made you? Like, what is wrong with you? Because they just, why? Like, this, this, like, why, daddy, turns into, why, daddy? Why? Why? Explain it to me, you know? And they, and they want this explanation. And so I find myself living in this tension sometimes, like, well, I don't want to explain. It just, you just need to understand. You don't understand. And, and, and parents, you know this is true. You've experienced this. It doesn't matter what you say. They can still say why. Like, you cannot keep the words from coming out of their mouth. So you explain, 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 and then they go, 
but why? You just like want to die, right? There, there are these moments like, and it's like they're asking this, okay? I'm just venting. Sorry, kids. Sorry. I'm not going to owe you money when I'm done. Because I'm not talking about you, of course. I'm talking about your sisters that are not in the service. So, somewhere <laughs> else. But it's like there's this moment when it's, it's as if they're saying to me, Dad, if you explain this and I agree with you, then I'll do it. If you explain this to me and it makes sense to me, then I'll do it. That's what they're demanding from me, right? And, and your children, those of you that have kids, you know what I'm talking about. When they're asking why, what they're looking for is enough common ground that they'll do what you're asking them to do. And you know what that isn't? That is not obedience. That's agreement. That's agreement. They're just looking for you to agree with them. They're just looking for, for common ground. But that is not a substitute for obedience here's what I want to say. The, the only reason that, that you'll do what I'm asking you to do is because it makes sense to you, not because I'm asking you to do it. There's a difference between obeying and agreeing. Saying to somebody, I'd be happy to obey you as long as this will make sense to me and I agree with you, that's not, that's not obedient. It's like there's times I feel like when the kids were little, you know, and they asked these questions, it's like they're saying, you know, Dad, tell me why. I mean, tell me, am I going to harm, you know, myself? Is this going to hurt my social standing? Is this going to affect my environment negatively, you know? Am I going to be gr not green with this decision? Like, and you just want to say, you're five, stop it, right? You're just like, quit asking these questions. But they're looking for some reason, like, explain this to me. Tell me why. What we're actually doing when we do that whether it's our kids doing it to us or whether us doing it with others or specifically with God, is we're failing, refusing to admit that there's a wisdom differential between us and God. When it happens with our kids, our kids are refusing to admit that there's a wisdom differential between us and them, right? That's what they're refusing to admit. I'm only going to do this if I can agree with you. We're refusing to trust unless it makes sense to us. That's what we're doing. And we live in a culture, this is the dynamic of our culture, we live in a culture that determines right and wrong based on whether or not there are negative impacts on everybody else. That's our, that's our societal norm today. There is no such thing as right and wrong necessarily. And what our culture is telling everybody is that right and wrong is determined by whether or not there are negative impacts on the people around us. And so we decide whether or not something is good based on whether or not it hurts somebody else, whether or not it's bad for somebody else, whether or not there are long-term consequences for somebody else. What we do when we determine right and wrong that way is take on the omniscience, the omnipotence of God, and we take that on ourselves. We assume the wisdom of God. What we do when we make the decision to determine right and wrong by whether or not there's negative impacts on us, our conscience, our relationships, our children, our futures, or our environment, what we're doing is saying, I have the ability in this precise moment to determine the outcome of this decision for the rest of eternity. That's what we do. When we decide that right and wrong is based on whether or not this negatively impacts anyone else, what we're saying is, I have the ability from this point in time to see into the future. And I can see my children, and I can see my conscience, and I can see my character, and I can see my economic situation. I can see all of it, and I know for a fact there's nothing negative about this decision. Do you realize what we're assuming when we do that? And when we demand an explanation that makes sense to us, do you realize what we're doing when we do that? When we demand that God explain himself and we only agree with the things that make sense to us, we're assuming the responsibility of his omnipotence. We're assuming the responsibility of being as wise as he is. We're refusing to acknowledge the differential, the gap between our wisdom and his wisdom. But that's our culture. Our, our culture is that way. I mean, we're immersed in this culture, and so we, we suddenly find ourselves, this is what happens for so many people. Maybe you, and this, this certainly happens for me. We find ourselves with this longing to draw near to God. And so we start making these decisions to draw closer to Him. And so maybe we start participating in a church. Maybe we start reading a Bible. We start... Um, we start praying, 
We start doing things like gathering with other people and studying. We start worshiping. Um, we, we maybe make the decision in that process somewhere along the line to start following Jesus, and we begin down this road. But inevitably what happens for us in our culture is at some point in time, we come to things in our faith. We read things in the Bible or we, we understand something uh, in a church environment. We hear something, and we, we come face to face with this thing, and we, we decide it's primitive. It's regressive. This doesn't make any sense. Why would this be here? We come, we come to this position where while we were drawing near to God and we were excited about certain things, suddenly we come to this point and we say, you know what, this doesn't make sense to me. And so, I, and so we, can, we, we don't necessarily confront it. We just dismiss it. We just cut that out. We say, you know what, I just don't have to listen to this part because this doesn't make any sense to me. And what that isn't is obedience. That's just simply saying, you know what, I'm only going to agree with the things that make sense to me. So we, we like to think about this chronologically. We like to think about all of these sorts of things that we run into that are difficult to understand or things that are potentially confrontational for us personally. We like to think of them chronologically. We like to look at the Bible and say, well, that was then and this is now. And so these things that were regressive and primitive, those things, we've grown out of those things. We're much smarter, more intelligent, more researched, like we know more today. And so now we can dismiss those things because chronologically we're at a different place than those people were back then. But what happens if we look at this culturally? What happens if we look at these difficult things that we face culturally? The reality is that it's not chronological that makes it difficult, it's cultural. There are certain people living in the world today that live in very traditional cultures, right? They live in, in very traditional cultures where things like family and tribe are valued above other things. Imagine being in a traditional culture today and you open up the Bible, a culture that, that puts the clan over everything else, and suddenly you hear the words of Jesus telling you to hate your father and mother, to leave your homes, to walk away from your families. How does that relate to you if you're coming from a traditional culture that values family? What happens when you read the words of the Apostle Paul and he says that your nationality, your ethnicity, your heritage all come secondary to your identity in Christ and that you're a Christ follower first and that you're a Jew or Gentile, black or white, slave or free second? How do you respond to that if you've grown up in a culture that finds family and clan and identity and ethnicity as valuable? You know how you respond? It hurts. What do I do with this? This is difficult. Now, what's fascinating is that's not a chronology issue. That's a cultural issue because in our culture, we look at most of those things and we say, oh, no, actually, that's really good. We affirm this. We affirm putting the ethnicity down below, right? We affirm putting the sociological differences beneath and that we identify in Christ first. We like these sorts of things, right? Because culturally, that fits well with us. We're okay leaving our, our, our fathers and mothers because we are a heavily individualistic culture that doesn't value family, right? So those things we look at and in two cultural contexts, the same thing can be something we embrace on one hand, and it can be something that is incredibly offensive on another hand. Spin that around and suddenly start talking about sexual issues. Start talking about the pursuit of pleasure. Start talking about hedonism. And this traditional culture looks at those things and says, well, that's a no-brainer. That one's easy. We agree with you. And then you come to our individualistic, pleasure-seeking, hedonistic, commercial culture today, and we go, I don't like that. That's uncomfortable. It's not chrono chronology that determines, it's cultural context. And what we find is the Bible is always going to be offensive at some level. To everybody in every culture, the gospel will always find us drawing things out of ourselves that we don't want to deal with, things that we don't agree with God on. And the issue is whether or not we're going to trust him or whether or not we ourselves are going to determine what's right and wrong based on what we think. And so the reason that this is wrong, the reason that this is happening is that God said so. And if we demand an explanation, then we're a child. We're being a child. Nick, Nick and I banter, and every now and then he throws this line on me. We'll be bantering about something, he'll you're being a child, and I want to punch him in the face. But usually he's right. There's nothing worse than, than being in that position and going, you're right. That's, that's exactly what this is. 
In this story, God is upset. We have no idea why. This seems very unusual for us. But when we ask what's wrong with it, why, 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 that reveals the problem inside of us. We have a trust issue. Most of us think, most of us think, if I know, if, if I know in my heart this is right, then I'll do it. But the Bible actually says the opposite. John, John chapter 7, 17, Jesus said, anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. If you're willing to do my will, then later on you'll discover that this is true. You'll look back and someday it will all come together. Hopefully my children someday will actually look at me and say, you know what, Dad? You were right. The Bible says obedience comes before understanding. You'll see. You think about the serpent was the ultimate, ultimate pragmatist. He comes into the garden one day. The serpent strolls in because he had legs back then. And he says, look at this place. This is awesome. This is yours? And Adam and Eve are like, yep, it is. And he goes, all of it? Yep, it's yours. It's, it's, we can do, like, we can just run naked, like whatever, you know, like what I'm assuming because of the s- pictures I saw in, when I was a kid growing up in church, you know. And then the serpent says, you can do whatever you want in here. And like, yeah, yeah, like anything. You can do anything you want. And they're like, yeah, yeah, like anything. It won't mean except there's one thing. And well, what is it? What's the one thing you can't do? Well, there's this one tree I can't eat from it. And they're like, what? Why? Why can't you eat from it? We don't know why. God just said no. Well, why? Well, God just told us. Well, why? You know, when you read in the the story in Genesis, it says that after they had reasoned with the serpent, they ate. And the rest of the book, the rest of the story of Scripture is God telling us to trust him again. The decision that ruined the whole thing was a decision not to trust. He said, I just want you to trust me to trust me. I just want you to trust me, to trust me. That's what this is about. This is wrong because God says it's wrong. Now, the second reason that this is wrong is that they're actually linked. Um, Israel has never had a standing army. Israel has never kept an army in barracks. Israel has always functioned as a, as a sort of a militia that was a defense-oriented militia. They defended their borders. People lived in their homes, and when a conflict arose, the people would flee from their homes. They would come together, and then they would go battle in a defensive posture towards other nations. And so this is fascinating. So why is God judging Israel? Well, why does God always judge people? Well, God judges people for human violence. Well, how is this human violence? Because God sees Israel for the first time in their history gathering a standing army. What do you do when you have a standing army? You look at them and you go, we got to do something with this, right? Let's just quit all the marching. We should leverage this. So David's calling this standing army. Now, David's logic is probably pretty good. Everybody in the world hates us, especially these big nations that are way out there. And so he says, we need this army so we can be quick to respond and we can fight and we'll be ready to go when that sort of thing happens. But in the meantime, they began looking out at all these little smaller nations that were right around them. And they said, you know what? We need to go conquer these smaller nations and take them as a buffer zone to protect ourselves. And so they began warring and bringing violence about on others. So the issue at hand The issue for God is that these people are beginning to rely on their army. There's all these verses, all these things that they had known growing up. Uh, um, Isaiah chapter 31, God has said this over and over. Woe to those who rely on the strength of their horses and the multitude of their chariots. Psalm chapter 20 says, Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. One of the reasons that we don't do what God says for us to do is that we don't trust him. The reason that David is drawing this army together is that there's a trust issue. David is saying, listen, I'm going to look at my military might, my economic might, my power. I'm going to look at these things for my security instead of God. That's the issue at hand here. We're going to respond violently and we're going to rely on our military strength for security and not on God. 
And God comes after David and he says, listen, I put you here not so that you would be like everybody else in culture with just a tiny little twist to you, but so that you would be on display a radically different humanity, that you would be a different group of people who love and bring justice and hope and peace to the world, not look like everybody else. Attacking nations because they're weaker, God says, I want you to trust me. I want you to trust me. And this isn't just a military issue. This is a trust issue. A couple weeks ago, I I wrote an article. um, It's on on our website. Our new website has a resource section that I encourage you to check out. We've been kind of loading it with different practical articles helping us integrate our faith into our life. A couple weeks ago, I wrote this article on, um, on giving because I think it's, there's a lot of questions people have about giving in the church and what it's like. In fact, it's actually, um, the title of it is, um, Why Does God Need My Money? And uh, that's a question I find myself asking sometimes because I like my money and I sometimes wonder, like, God, why do you need it if you're God? Um, so why do you need my money? So it's a good article. I want to encourage you to read it at some point. Um, but, but I unpacked a few really important things that I think a lot of people um, don't understand about giving. And in fact, um, um, I also put some statistics in there that are staggering, and I want to share some of them with you. But, but the idea is this, if believers, if people that were Christ followers, if everybody that in America that said they followed Jesus decided to give 10% of their income to the church, what would happen? That's kind of the idea. Now, I want to preface this by saying, in that article, I actually undo the biblical foundation for tithing 10%. So that should interest some of you. You're like, oh, what's this all about? So I encourage you to go check that out because um, tithing is not a New Testament biblical concept, and that's in that article, and I encourage you to read that. But it's a great starting place, and that's what I'll present. If we just started and said, okay, God, 90% is mine, 10% is yours, we're going to give it back to the church, what would that look like? In America today, that would result in $165 billion extra dollars for local churches around the U.S. to utilize and distribute. $165 billion in one year, just this year. If everybody just said, I think I can give up 10%. Now, I know those numbers, you kind of hear those and you go, those are, that's, whenever you hear really, really big numbers, you just kind of go flat, right? It's just like, okay, really big number. I want to put the really, really big number, the 165 billion number in, in perspective for you. Um, the global impact of, of these kind of dollars is pretty phenomenal. To put it in perspective, um, if you wanted to... Um, If you wanted to relieve global hunger and starvation and deaths from preventable diseases, you could do it in five years with $25 billion. Remember, we have 165 in our checking account. We just just need 25 of that to solve world hunger. $12 billion could eliminate illiteracy in five years. No one on the planet would be illiterate with $12 billion. $15 billion could solve the world's water and sanitation issues, specifically in places where 1 billion people live on less than a dollar per day. All the overseas missions work that, that uh, Christians do, a billion dollars would fund all of it. You do all that stuff, Remember you had, we had 165, you do all that stuff? You still have 100 billion left over. We could take a trip to the moon if we wanted to. Like, let's go. We, we solve world hunger, right? Nobody's living in poverty, and we can go to the moon. This sounds like a pretty good deal if we would do this sort of thing. Um, now, what I point out in the article is, is, is this, and this is what I want you to understand. Yes, some great things could be done if we took generosity and what God talks about around generosity seriously, But the bigger issue and why God needs your money isn't the money, it's your heart. Because in our culture, the issue is the money. We rely not on horses and chariots, but on the almighty dollar. We find our security, our peace in money, in what produces money, in our safety around money. That's what we have determined is our security blanket. We trust money more than we trust God. It's that simple. That's the issue. 
And the Bible is going to tell us all kinds of things. That is one example of many things that as we read the pages of Scripture and we understand what it looks like to live as a gospel-centered person, there are going to be things like this and many others that are going to rub us the wrong way. And we're going to think, man, I don't know if I can do that. And in those moments, we have to make a decision about whether or not we're going to trust God or whether or not we're going to trust ourselves to see what's right or what's wrong. And so God is judging Israel. That's the issue. God's saying, listen, not only are, are are you bringing violence against others, but you're not trusting me. And I've already said, don't do this. This is wrong on every level. And so God begins this judgment in this story. And in the middle of this story, which it doesn't seem obvious at first, there's this there's this moment of grace where God extends grace in the middle of this. Why would God extend grace in the middle of this? I mean, at first glance, it doesn't look like grace because if, if you think back to what we read at the beginning, David makes this mistake and then this guy from Gad comes and says, you have three choices. They're really great. You can either live in famine for three years, you can experience military defeat for three months, or for three short days, you can experience pestilence, right? And so... We all just said pestilence, right? It just makes all the sense in the world, right? That's the way you can save your nation. You have these three choices. David chooses three days of plagues, three days of pestilence. And then something really interesting happens. Right in the middle of the plague, it says this. Verse 16, And when the angel stretched out his hand toward Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from calamity and said to the angel who was working destruction among the people, It's enough. Now stay your hand. I want you to notice that, th- that this is in the middle of the middle of this prescribed penalty that God has given. Jerusalem hasn't been touched yet. And for some reason, God relents. Literally, when it says that God relents, there's this, there's this idea being presented in the word that's used in Hebrew that says God mourns, he weeps. There's this moment where God literally cries. There's this aching inside of God as he watches this moment take place and he extends grace. The question is why? Why does God extend grace in this moment? You could even ask, why does God extend grace to David when he didn't extend it to Saul? The answer is David's response. And this is why this story wraps up so beautifully and why it's such a great finishing picture of who David is. David does three things, and this is why his life is surrounded by grace. This is why David lives in this position of grace. I don't think there's a better way to wrap up this series than looking at how he responded. First, David repented. It's the first thing that David did. I know we're not comfortable with that word today. It just seems sort of foreign in our culture, but David repents. It says in verse 10 that David's heart struck him after he numbered the people, and David said to the Lord, I've sinned greatly in what I've done, but now, O Lord, please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I've done foolishly. Literally, David says that his heart was just struck with this moment of, what have I done? Contrast this to that moment when David had had this affair with Bathsheba and sinned against Uriah and Nathan had to come with a two by four and say, look at what you've done. Like he's like, are are you aware of this? Now we have this moment where David is just almost immediately, he makes the decision. He goes, oh, what have I done? There's this moment of repentance that takes place. You know what this is? Believe it or not, this is growth. Some people think that people that are spiritually mature or spiritually growing, they repent less. The reality is just the opposite, and we see it in David. The reality is is that the, the deeper you get in your faith, the more you understand God and His grace, the quicker you are to repent. The faster you repent, the more readily you repent. And that's the case with David. He's repenting. The frequency increases as you grow. And now, if you believe that a morally disciplined, very clean looking life is what Christianity is all about, this is really difficult to do. (laughs) Because that means that every single time you repent, you have to undo where you find your meaning. But if you believe the gospel, and the gospel says that you're broken, so broken that you're in need of a Savior, and that that Savior has loved you so much that he's died for you, then if that's the case, repentance should be easy. David's experiencing this. He understands this. And repentance becomes something that brings this release, this, this moment of freedom. Repentance brings a sweetness to your life. Repentance renews the relationship. It puts us back into community with God. And the more you understand that, the more you experience that, the more it happens. 
the more you find yourself saying, I was out of line. Oh, my heart. And you respond positively to that. You, you don't respond to I me. Mean, how do you know you're, you're growing in grace? You're not a person who demands that everybody hear your perspective. How, how do you know that you're a person growing in grace? You don't demand an apology from people. How do you know that you're growing in grace? You don't need to defend yourself. How do you know you're growing in grace? When people have criticism of you, you, you tell them things that they didn't already know so they think even less of you, right? It's like, oh, you think that's bad. Let me just tell you a few other things. Oh, let me really disappoint you because this is who I am. Because you're okay with that. You're, un, you understand your brokenness. You understand your humanity. And you're, you're readily saying, I'm, all, I'm growing in grace in this. The chief of believers is the chief of repenters. Are you experiencing the release that comes from repentance? There's freedom in repentance. Grace is extended because David repents. And then we see David abandon his idol, which is incredibly important. David repents, and then David leaves this idol. All of us, the, the human heart, we long for things to find as a savior. Whether it's money, or whether it's a job, or whether it's a relationship, or whether it's a status, or whether it's a career, whatever, whatever that thing is. It, it, could be our, it could be good things. It can be our families. It can be our homes. It can be whatever. If we find our security in anything, it becomes a functional savior. It becomes an idol. And in this situation, David has made his military might an idol. And in one moment, David takes his heart and he repositions it and is no longer dependent on those things for security and power, but he's dependent on God. There's this crazy thing that takes place where, where, where David has the choice of, of three years of famine, three months of losing battles, or three days of plague. And, and I think for most of us, and, and for me included, I'm a rip the band-aid off kind of guy right? Like, just rip the band-aid off. And I, I used to look at this and think, that's what David was doing. It was just like, man, three years of misery, three months of misery, or three days of misery. I'll take three days, right? Wrong. The reality is that David looks at these three options, and he realizes his idol would allow him to go confront the reality of, of whether or not he would be defeated in battle for three months. His economic standing, he might actually try to rise up and fight off the, the plague or the, or the famine that might come into his land, but the pestilence that he chooses is something that is so completely out of his control that he can do nothing to defend against it. Do you realize that? Like David chooses the one thing that he had no control over, and he does it willingly on purpose. In fact, there's this, there's this moment, he tells us why. In verse 14, and let me just tell you, this is one of the most insightful things you will ever hear from the mouth of David. Then David said to Gad, not God, Gad would go tell God for David. David said to Gad, I'm in great distress. Let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is great, but let me not fall into the hand of man. Why does David say this? Because David recognizes that God is the only God who extends mercy. All of the other idols that we have, all of the other things that we find our security and our meaning and our being in, they do not extend mercy. They will grind us into the ground. And when they fail us, when he walks out, when she walks out, when the job goes away, when the stock market crashes, when the house burns down, no matter what it is, right? When, when the kids leave home, whatever it is you've made your idol, whatever that thing is, when it leaves you, when it, when it goes south on you, it will grind you into the ground. It is merciless. And David knows that. He knows that if I have made my army my idol, when it fails me, there will be no mercy. And so he chooses God who extends mercy. Whatever you make that thing, it, it will not give you mercy. God is the only God that does that. So David gives it up, and then David gives a sacrifice. But this is fascinating. There's something that happens in the last few verses where David offers a substitute, and this is, this is interesting. So David repents, and then David takes this idol and removes it from his heart. And then the last thing that he does is walk in the pattern of Jesus. 
And I want you to see what he does. In verse 17, it says that David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people and said, Behold, I've sinned and I've done wickedly, but these sheep, what have they done? Please let your hand be against me and against my father's house. See what David says? He goes, no, 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 this can't be true. Like, if you're going to do something to these people, do this to me. Like, let me take on the punishment. Let me do this sort of thing. Let me, let me like, whatever this is, bring the wrath on to me. And, and in this moment, God tells David to build an altar and to offer an animal sacrifice. And if you read the New Testament, and if you even just think about this intuitively, you realize, what does an animal sacrifice do? It doesn't do anything for this. It doesn't resolve this in any sort of way. What's going on here? Why would God, in this moment, stop his hand and then say, okay, now let's have an animal sacrifice on top of this hill? What's going on? The secret is in 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1. There's this moment when Solomon, David's son, is building the temple, and I want to read this to you. It says, Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to David his father at the place that David had appointed on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. Solomon is building the temple on Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah is where David is offering the sacrifice. Do you know what else happened on Mount Moriah? It's the same place where Abraham took up Isaac and built an altar and laid his son on it and started to kill him. And God said, withhold your hand. And he offered a sacrifice to substitute. And now we have David standing in this place. And God has said to the angel, stop your hand. And we have an, an animal being given as a sacrifice, and we have this picture being painted in the language of God mourning, of him grieving, as if God can see this same place, this same mountain, as he can look into the future and realize that this David who's taking on the sins of his people, taking on the error of this people, is pointing to the true David. This David who says, why should the sheep suffer? Why not let me suffer? David's following in the pattern of, of Jesus. I look at these moments and I just go, how do you look at a God who does this and question his provision? For me, there's times I just wonder about God's timing. I think, why, why can't you work this out quicker? Like, what are you doing? Why couldn't you have done this? And I read stories like this, and I go, are you kidding me? Like, there's this moment where, where all of these things are connecting, and you see David pointing in his lifetime, David pointing to Jesus and walking in this example. Like, how is this even possible? Like, wh why would I want to hurry God? Why would I question God? Why would my trust be weak in him? If he's willing to do this, can I trust him? Like God in this moment is looking down and he's realizing, I'm going to put my son in this exact situation. And he knows it. Here's what's fascinating about this life of David. I think we have this tendency to look and go, you know what, David's life is so spectacular with all the ups and the downs, but you know what David's life is? It's our life. This is our life. This is, this is what it looks like to live a life of faith. The reason that we're so compelled by this story and the reason why for 21 weeks we can look at it and be drawn in is because there's something about this story of David that we just get, we understand where he's coming from, and there's something that draws us in. We look and we say, this is a life of faith. This is what it is. And if you want to live a life of faith, if you want to know what it looks like to live covered with the grace of God, then live a life of constant repentance, not of pride and arrogance, not of some sort of religiosity, but of constant repentance, acknowledging, God, I make mistakes and I trust your grace and your mercy. And live a life where, where God is the one you trust, not some sort of idol. Don't put your trust in other things. That's what David does over and over again. Does he get it right every time? No. That's what I love about the story. That's what you love about the story story is that David gets it right just like I did and then he turns around and he gets it wrong just like I did but what do we have we have David repenting and coming back and he's always saying no God my trust is always going to be in you that's the challenge of this story is he's saying repent trust and then depend on the sacrifice of Christ and live that out live in the example that Jesus has set for you of laying down your life 
for others. That's what David does. That's why we're compelled by it. Is he perfect? No. Are you perfect? No. But we have a God who's big enough to tell us these kinds of stories, to draw us in so that we can live lives of extraordinary faith.